Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We have our penultimate episode of Women of Rock today, and we're checking out a band called The New Pornographers. The track we're going to be looking at is Letter from an Occupant. And, uh, I've heard the name of the band before. I kind of have them in, like, an indie rock kind of area and, uh, filed away, but I don't know why I have that, uh, understanding of them, because I don't think I've ever heard their music before. So, let's get into this. Uh, like I said, New Pornographers, Letter from an Occupant. interesting spacing out of these instruments the right side ends up being so much louder than anything else hard time putting any thoughts together on this one. just has so much forward momentum and drive it's one idea into the next into the next into the next just taking no moment to really just relax and chill at all uh it's, it's just i mean it's just drive Moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. Every idea sort of continues on into the next with minor variation to them up until we hit that big moment uh, when we shift to that odd rhythmic structure right, right there before the end, maybe a minute before the track was over, 40 seconds. 
Um, okay. I'm going to preface that this song bounced off of me real hard. I don't know if that's just because it's not what I typically listen to or there's something odd about it that maybe I haven't picked up on enough to articulate, but I felt maybe it's something that could grow on me over time. I don't know, but uh, yeah, just <sighs> I want to put that out there because I'm having a real tough time analyzing it and really putting what I heard into words um but I do just want to say that I can't I can't quite say that I enjoyed it um let's move from the subjective into the objective what happened here what what do we hear well first thing I want to point out which is prevalent through the entire track is the production there is some really nice ideas going on here. There's some nice separation of instruments. Uh, we have the dual vocals, which I think have nice spatial uh, element to them. Um, a lot of the instruments are mixed well in that I can hear pretty much everything that's being played, whether it's the drum or the synthesizer, the keyboard, the bass, the two guitars. Like I can hear everything. I think that's really nice. I don't know when this came out. Uh, the video is only a year old, and I'm going to... Yeah, it says pre-order the 21st anniversary of this album. <laughs> I'm going to assume that this is a, a much older album, at least two decades now. Um, so, you know, just given that we're looking at what, like a late 90s, early 2000s album, maybe earlier than that... It's uh, it's just really nice to have such clear production in the track, especially since there's so many moving objects, moving lines, moving ideas, concepts. I think that's what I wanted to say. Uh, but there is one large oddity, and that's the volume waiting. And I have to, it struck me immediately. It never went away. It persisted, and my audio visualizer continues to affirm it. The right side was louder than the left at every moment of the song. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is that syncopated, chunky guitar riff, right? Because there was a guitar that was just constantly playing eighth notes, I think. Uh, but there's the lead electric guitar that's most prominent in the right uh, headphone that uh, it had a rhythmic idea. It was like da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da, 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 something like that. Like I said, not constant, these little chunks of uh, riffs. It was so much louder than what was happening on the left side. And this was most prevalent in the verses. When the chorus came in, the volume kind of popped up for a lot of things and balanced it out a little bit. It was still present. But in the verses, the only thing on our left side is really the drums, some of the drums, and the bass. And I really enjoyed that the bass was quite present across this entire track. There wasn't a moment when I was like, what's the bass doing? I can't hear it. It's muddied up or it's, you know, hidden under stuff. It was always present audibly, but it didn't have the volume punch that the right guitar did. So we have this loud idea in our right and a quieter idea in our left. And that pretty much is how a lot of this song was mixed with our lead guitar given prominence in the spotlight, but weighted to one side. It's not unusual to give a lead guitar a bit more spotlight than some of the other instruments. But a lot of rock is going to, if they're going that route of having a lead guitar line, to either center it or put it on both sides. It's not going to dominate in the spotlight off to the side. It's very unbalanced. The whole song felt like I was trying to tip my head this way with just so much weight. Um, I, I think it, eventually I did kind of get more used to it. But there wasn't a single point in the track when I was like, okay, this is fine. This is enjoyable. It was always a distracting element for me. But aside from that one idea, like I said, I'm very happy with the cleanliness of 
the, or the clarity, I should say. It wasn't a super clean sound. There was some grit and bite all throughout the track. I don't know how much of that is just it being an older track or how much of it they really wanted that extra bit of compression put on everything, but there's a clarity to it all. I can hear every instrument. And I think that's what I meant to say rather than clean. Because it is a bit gritty. It is a bit dirty. But there's a clarity to all the instruments. That I personally appreciate. Um, so yeah, like I said, that was the first thing that stood out to me. Then we have the layering. So I mentioned we have this, this uh, chunky guitar riffing over here. We have our bass. What is our bass doing though? A lot of the song, quarter notes uh, following the chord progression. So it's like... Just every beat, they play a note, and from what it sounded like to my ear, it was the root of the chord. Whenever the guitar changed chords, the bass changed its note. So that's that's the entire thing. No matter what anything else is doing, except for the one section, which is going to be a... A caveat I'm going to include on pretty much everything. So you just imagine that I'm going to say that the one section where we hit the rhythmically different part that was sort of odd rhythmically, it went against the patterns that we see throughout every other section of the track. Um, so the bass does not do this quarter note strike in that bridge, but in every other part of the song it does. And it kind of lays down this rhythmic idea alongside with the drums while also following the chord alongside with the guitars. Very typical uh, bass work right there. I wish, uh, I don't know if I should say it. I wish there was more movement to it. <laughs> but I understand that it wouldn't really be rock at that point, right? It's, I, I probably should stop bringing that up, but... I feel like the bass is constantly underutilized in tracks like this when it just plays the root and follows rhythmically what the drums are doing, uh, harmonic, not harmonic, chordally, what the guitars are doing. And it sits in this nice middle ground between the two, but it really could accent rhythmic aspects with a little bit more flair and it could contribute to the chordal ideas with a little bit more flair. I mean, I'm not going to say that walking a bass line in jazz is much different. You still pretty much hit quarter notes and you follow along with the chord, but there's more movement, there's more identity to it. Um, and I think it's just because jazz really focuses in on the bass as the foundation of the rhythm section, rather than being a middle ground between two other instruments that do its job better. Rock and jazz just have very different uh, visions of what the bass should do. And uh, it's not fair to compare the two, but I don't know. I really like the bass, and I just feel like it's it's always under you. It's given a jack-of-all-trades middle ground section. Um, I feel like if a lot of bands could fill in the low end without a bass, they probably wouldn't have a bassist. That's what I think about a lot of bass work I hear in uh, rock music. Um, what else do we got? Oh, we have a guitar that is just constant eighth note strumming of the chord. <clears throat> it kind of sits in opposition of our lead electric guitar, which is rhythmically chunking up the chordal strikes. Uh, this is just a constant eighth note, but the chord progression is similar, uh, or is identical, of course. The whole band's following it. So it's sort of doubling up on what our lead guitar is doing and mostly providing extra texture because I think it's either a clean guitar or an acoustic guitar, uh, whereas our lead electric has a bit of a, a gritty distortion to it, a little bit of a bite. There is this really neat keyboard idea that I love. It's... Uh, it's kind of, it's not syncopated because it mostly works within eighth notes, much like our chunking electric guitar, uh, where it plays three or four notes at a time and then takes a couple of rests and plays a few more notes. Um, but I think it's most interesting to look at as a contrasting element to a lot of the rest of the band. It's continuing on with this idea of eighth note hits. So we're not really getting a lot of variety rhythmically, but when you include the silence and the way that 
I think its phrasing is different than our lead guitar. We get different pockets of silence that kind of have syncopated silence, which is a weird way to say that. But our lead guitar and our keyboard have silence at different points in their phrases. And so we have moments when they're both playing and we get these dyads and then we get moments where one's playing and then maybe, uh, you know, the other one's playing and then they're together again and then this one's off and then they're together and then this one's off and then they're back together and it's this nice little uh, dance that they're doing. Um, I really do wish the keyboard was a bit louder though because it is, in a sense, the counter melody or counter foundation to what this lead guitar is doing on our right side. They both have a similar idea, but their phrasing is in opposition. So we have, like I mentioned, this interesting dance of dyads and single notes with different uh, timbres to them. And they're even positioned in opposition with the guitar on the right and the keyboard on the left. And yet the keyboard feels drowned out by the bass, which already isn't super loud to begin with. It really is a shame. Um, unfortunately, I only heard that in the verses. I don't know what the keyboard is doing in the choruses or the bridge. Just couldn't pick it up. Uh, and I've already mentioned that the verse, I mean the choruses, uh, everything got a bit of a volume boost. I wonder if the keyboard just didn't. Uh, and just, you know, everything else came up and just, it was already, like I said, it was already a bit uh, disguised or uh, hidden beneath uh, some of the other instruments. Really, it was just the fact that it was isolated on a side that already didn't have a, vol a lot of volume to it that really helped me hear it in the verses. Once everything gets a little bit of a boost to bring up the energy, it just gets lost. Uh, and I honestly don't know what happened in the bridge because, well, I was kind of paying too much attention to the rhythm because everybody was doing the same thing, uh, which actually it could have just been lost in that if it was following along with every other instrument. Uh, but I had a real tough time really figuring out what was happening there. Uh, and then our drums. It's just some basic drumming. Uh, <clears throat> not that that's a bad thing. There's definitely a skill in just being a really strong metronome for the band. Um, that's what it was, though. A lot of it was, uh, what, hi-hat, snare, and bass. Um, and just kind of sitting in it. The hi-hat is constant. Snare is like two and four and the bass dances around the snare. Uh, pretty typical stuff there. A lot of this is typical rock music. Um, it really is how they go about crafting the energy of it all and introducing interesting ideas that unfortunately get drowned out in the mix that I think really separates it a bit from generic rock if there is such a thing. Stereotypical rock might be another way we could word that. Um, it is a shame, like I said, though, that I think the more interesting bits are getting drowned out. And finally, we have our vocalist. Uh, we have a vocal line. Uh, verse and chorus all kind of sit within the same range. Not a lot of movement. It's uh, mostly just kind of sitting on a note and kind of hovering around it. We're looking at maybe, you know, six to eight note uh, range there, give or take. Uh, there is one moment, there's one note in the chorus that I think the vocalist jumps up a bit and hits, and it's also the note that, we, the, the note, it's the note that gets harmonized. I don't know why there's one harmonized note in the entire song. Uh, I really love it. I think it's a really interesting dyad that's created. I don't think it's like a first and a third. Um, I, I don't, I actually don't know what the relationship is between the two. It provides um, a sharpness to the song because there is this overall we'll get into that in a moment um but the secondary vocalist is panned right which already has a ton of volume to it really left is the open side and i don't know why i didn't get panned left or kept it centered uh very interesting that the producer just really wanted to weight this right side down i'm still very baffled by it um but yeah, there's, there's an overall, you know, I mentioned that there's a, a bite to the production. There's, there's a little bit of grit on everything, but it's also a very round, soft sound. I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly aggressive or abrasive about the overall sonic qualities of the track. 
Uh, and I think a lot of that just comes down to the fact that we have a clean or acoustic guitar. We have a bass that doesn't have a lot of compression on it. We have drums that are rather clean. There's nothing real gritty about them. We have a vocal style that is just very comfortable and clean. And we have an electric guitar. And it has a little bit of bite to it. And then there's a little bit of compression overall in the track, which kind of, at least to me, makes it sound a bit older. Um, but that's it. You know, there there is an element of bite. There is an element of compression on it. But overall, the song is just very palatable. And again, not a bad thing. When I said palatable, I was like, man, that's got some negative connotations to it. And I just wanted to reiterate, not a bad thing to make something that's palatable. Uh, palatable. It's just, it's very, I don't know. Nor normally I have words for everything. I, uh, I don't know quite what I want to say here. But yeah, it's just... I, I guess I wanted to bring this up in opposition to this dyad that we've created because the overall sonic quality is rather warm and inviting. Uh, a lot of the chordal ideas are rather inviting. This is not a song that I think too many people would be like, whoa, that's harsh. You know, I, I don't want to listen to that. Um, but there's something about this dyad that comes up that gives it a little bit of extra, mm, a little bit of extra spice that uh, I think the song desperately needed. At least in my ears. Alright, what's next? What's next? Uh, oh, yeah, the bridge. I honestly still have no idea what's going on here. This is a weird section. If you follow along with the drums, it's obviously in 4-4. We haven't shifted anything like that. But there's something odd going on with the rhythm. And I think that there are actually two rhythms going on where the majority of the band was following one idea of chunking, and it was like three notes and then a rest, and three notes and a rest, which should line up really well with 4-4, four, four, but for some reason didn't. And I think that's because of a second uh, rhythm that might have been coming from the cymbal work. Maybe the, you know, maybe the keyboard could have been doing it too. I don't know. I, I'd have to go back and listen. I just remember it being very disjointed. And I remember when the vocals came in, uh, and started their line, I was like, this is one, based on what the drums are telling me, but what the band is telling me is that she started in the middle of a bar. And there's just like this weird rhythmic thing going on, polyrhythmic thing possibly, where I had a tough time figuring out where one was if I wasn't listening to the drums. Uh, and it makes me think that the core rhythm that most of the other instruments, the melodic instruments are playing, is not based on the downbeat of the bar. And it really creates this section that, at least to me, feels like our melodic instruments and our rhythmic instruments are clashing and trying to tear the song apart. There is a strong divide here that where the rest of the song is in unison and rather palatable, we reach this point that ditches all of that. The instruments used to be playing fair, and now they're at war with each other. And uh, it really feels like the song is beginning to fall apart. I'm wondering if any of this is going to show up in the lyrics uh, to kind of see some thematic similarity between the music and what's being sung about. But it's a really odd section of the song that, at least to me, works well on a contrasting level, but I don't know that it adds much to my enjoyment of the song. In fact, it's another distracting moment. I don't want to say it detracts from the song overall. Of course, that's going to be a subjective thing, and your enjoyment of that section is going to determine if you think that it adds or removes uh whatever you value in music. But for me, it kind of comes out of nowhere and immediately reminds me that I'm not on a journey, I'm, or that I'm not listening to art, that this is music, right? And it puts me into that analytical mode of what's going on here rather than what's the song doing uh, as an art. And so, much like the odd... Uh, spatial stuff going on in the production it's a moment that takes me out of the moment um and at least 
for a first time listen interrupts my flow of understanding the song. Um, so I am curious where other people sit on that though, especially if this is your first time listening. Did you find anything abrasive about that moment or was it rather easy to listen to and I'm just an oddball? Uh, I'm like I said, I'm real curious about that. You know, the more that you listen to something, the less it becomes unexpected, and the more that the unusual elements feel usual because you now expect them. It's a bit of a, a cyclical loop. The more you expect it, the more it's going to feel normal, in which case the more that it feels normal, the more you should expect it. Um, I think that's just how a lot of music works, uh, or films even, or any art, honestly. Things can only be abrasive or unexpected. I think unexpected is a better word. Um, you know, so many times before it becomes expected. And when it's expected, it is less abrasive, usually. You begin to understand, maybe not technically understand what's going on, but feeling-wise, you, you kind of, you can feel it out, right? It's like people who have listened to a song with an odd time signature forever. They know they know the groove, right? They might not know exactly what the time signature is. They couldn't count it out if you asked them to, but they would be able to groove along with it. It might have been odd the first time they listened to it. They still don't understand the time signature of that section, but they can feel it out just fine. They, uh, they expect, they have a strong expectation of what's going to happen. Uh, and, you know, that's why I said specifically, if this song's new to you, how did you interpret it? Because I think longtime fans are just, it's just part of the song, right? And you've reached that point where maybe it doesn't feel so odd anymore because that's how the song's supposed to go. That's how the song's gone the thousands of times you've heard it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a really weird point in the track for me. All right, I guess we're going to hit up uh, lyrics here because... Oh, no, I need to talk about Drive. I mentioned that the song was driving, just always going in a single direction. Um, let me pull up the letters, though. The letters. Let me pull up the lyrics real quick. Um, so there's this forward momentum, there's this drive that's going on in this track. And what I mean by that is each of the sections is constantly moving forward. A lot of that comes down to the similar rhythmic vibe from a lot of the instrumentation. I mentioned that our bass is constantly laying down quarter notes. It never really lets up on that. Then we also have an acoustic or clean guitar that is constantly laying down eighth notes, which is twice as often as the quarter note. And whether it's the verse or the chorus or the post-chorus, this rhythmic drive this real static, rigid drive continues on. It never relents. And by the end of the song, I felt like we were just moving between ideas so quickly. Uh, for all I know, the verses were like two th or four lines each as far as the lyrics go. Our chorus was like one sentence. It just felt, it felt like by the end of the track, we were just booking it right through. Um... And, you know, some of that I think is just going to be the amount of time we're in each of these sections, but there's also this underlying rhythmic component. Like I said, doesn't really change. When we go from our verse to our chorus, our volume increases. I think our bass changes what it does a little bit. Uh, our vocal melody changes, but that uh, clean guitar keeps up with those eighth notes. The electric gu guitar ditches the chunky idea to do straight eighth notes. Uh, so we have this this forward push when we leave from the chorus back into the verse. Our clean guitar is still doing these eighth notes forward. Our bass is still doing these quarter notes moving forward. Nothing really stops or has a moment to breathe or pause or reflect. There really isn't a moment when our instruments stop constantly playing. Where we have this rigid, continuous hit. Uh, and so the song just, it just moves. It never stops. Um, and like I said, by the end of the track, it uh, it feels like it starts moving rather quickly. Um, so yeah, let's see what's going on lyrically here, because I didn't pick up any lyrics other than a uh, letter from an occupant. <laughs> um, so let's see. 
I'm told the eventual downfall is just a bill from the restaurant. You told me I could order the moon, babe, just as long as I shoot what I want. What the last 10 minutes have taught me, bet on the hand that your money's on. Where the hell of the 70s brought me, you traded me away long gone. Chorus, for the love of God, you say not a letter from an occupant. Or maybe, for the love of God, you say, not a letter from an occupant. Maybe that's kind of the vibe they're going for there. But this, I mean, I'm kind of lost. Verse 2, the time that your enemy gives you, good times are not the ones you want. I've cried five rivers on the way here, which one will you skate away on? The tune you'll be humming forever, all the words are replaced and wrong with a shower of yas and whatever's you traded me away, long gone. And then our bridge is just, where have all the sensations gone? And our outro is, the song has shaken me. I got nothing here. I really don't. So, there is nothing I can really do about tying themes together. I'm just going to end this here and ask for some help if anybody has any insight on this. Those are my thoughts on the new pornographer's letter from an occupant. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know if you agree or disagree with anything I stated, if you enjoyed the song, and if you have any thoughts or perspective on the lyrics. Uh, I kind of get the feeling it's referencing something specific that I just don't have the knowledge on, or maybe the perspective on. Uh, and it's just completely rendered the meaning of the song cryptic to me. So... Yes, comments. I'll, I'll definitely be reading comments on this one. I mean, I read comments. I read every comment that comes in, even if the video is like two years old. But I'm going to be looking forward to the comments on here. Man, that also sounds like I don't look forward to... Man, you guys know what I mean though, right? Like, I'm curious about the lyrical stuff here. I might even end up going over to uh, uh, Song Meanings. Is that is that place? Is that still a place? <laughs> SongMeanings.com? I used to go there a lot. Uh, in like the, when I was in the, my twenties, when, uh, when a song kind of went over my head lyrically, I don't even know if that place is still around though. Um, anyways, yeah, comments, description box, and there's a link for it. link tree it takes you to this menu right here, which has everything related to the channel. You can find my merch. You can pick up, uh, nope, not pick, pick up some merch, join the Patreon, join the discord, join the Twitter email me, whatever you want, a bunch of stuff's there, go ahead and check it out. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps up this video. We have one more special selection for the day. Otherwise, we'll be back tomorrow with our final Women in Rock video and a return to create a request. That's what it's called. And we'll check out a band, usually a, a smaller band that's contacted me and asked me to specifically check out their music. All right, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.